So remainder of the night. Um, last chapter, we're going to talk about mostly colligative properties. And it's really properties of solutions. So when we're talking about a solution here, what does that imply? What two components are always part of any solution? Solute and solvent. So we're not talking about pure liquids anymore. We're talking about the property of a solution, a solvent that has solutes in it. So I want to talk about colligative properties. A colligative property is a property that changes as you add solute. The more solute you add, the more that property changes. So, and these are the standard four we typically talk about. Freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, vapor pressure depression, and osmotic pressure. So if you look, what's the freezing point of water? Zero, Zero degrees Celsius. So, but as you actually start pouring something into the water, it doesn't really matter what you pour in as long as it's not more water, but you can pour salt in the water. You can pour sugar in the water. You can pour just about anything in the water as long as it's not water. And the freezing point of the solution that results is no longer zero degrees Celsius. This, the freezing point actually gets depressed. It goes down. Kind of why they call depressed being down in the dumps. Depression in a literal sense means down. So decreasing. And so the freezing point will be lower than zero degrees Celsius. This is why they salt the roads in cold climates. Anybody from cold climate? Cool, where are you from? Michigan. Yeah, you have to find cold climate. So in Michigan, they salt the roads in the winter, right? So why do they salt the roads? I don't know, but my dad does it too when he makes the concrete, so I should know. <laughs> so, but they, they salt the roads actually to melt the ice. And the way this works, let's say it's negative five degrees outside on a warm winter day in Michigan. So minus five degrees Celsius outside. It's pretty darn cold. So if it's minus five degrees Celsius, if it's pure water, will it be liquid or solid? It'll be solid and it'll be ice and ice is very slippery and more dangerous for road conditions than say water is, right? Liquid water. And so however, when they salt the roads, the freezing point of water is no longer zero anymore. And let's say they add enough salt to get it to go down to negative 10 degrees Celsius for the freezing point. Okay, if the freezing point is now negative 10, well, outside on this warm Michigan day, the temperature was negative five. Now, what phase does the water exist in? It's now in the liquid phase. It melted the ice in this case, and it melted the ice by lowering the freezing point. So, and now the roads are not so hazardous and yada yada, but your car rusts a whole lot faster and all sorts of other issues, but at least you're not like driving like a crazy person. So freezing point depression. And again, it doesn't really matter what you dissolve in the solvent. The idea here is that dissolving anything in the solvent will disrupt the intermolecular forces that the solvent is used to having in such a way. So in the case of freezing point, let's say, that when you freeze it, you usually get this nice crystal structure. It's nice and ordered. Every molecule looks exactly the same. So if you have square molecules, great. Square, 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 square. Squares all stack on each other really nicely. But all of a sudden, let's say you dissolve a solute in there. And I don't care what the solute is, as long as it's not one of these molecules, i.e. in this case, as long as it's not a square, it doesn't fit. And so here's the deal. If the molecules fit very nicely into a crystal, then you don't have to cool them down as far to get them to crystallize. And so you have a higher freezing point. But all of a sudden now, I have this irregular shape, this solute molecule. And now I got to slow the molecules down even more, cool them down even further to get them to crystallize. And so the freezing point, which is the same as the melting point, is now lower as a result. So, and it doesn't really matter what this is, as long as it's not a square. And so it doesn't really matter what the solute is. It's just anything other than the solvent that'll be irregularly shaped. Cool. And so that's why freezing points go down. Now, boiling point elevation, this is a little bit tricky. Because with boiling points, it's not about crystal structures at all, right? With boiling, it's liquid versus gas, not solid involved at all. So it's not about crystals. In boiling points, let's say you put sol you know, sodium chloride in water. So it turns out when you put a typical solute like NaCl in there, you actually get some ion dipole forces in there that actually overall result in a general increase in the intermolecular forces inside that solution now as compared to pure water. And if there's higher overall intermolecular forces, then the overall boiling point had to go up. So on and so forth. And 
if it takes more energy to boil the solution now, then you'll find less of the liquid's vapor, less of the liquid will escape to foreign vapor, so you get a lower vapor pressure as well. And osmotic pressure, we're just going to talk about later. Now here's the deal. Again, it largely, to a significant degree, doesn't really matter what the solute is in most of these cases. But the more of these solute molecules, ions, whatever they are, the more of them you have, the bigger the impact on any one of these colligative properties. And so things get a little bit tricky. Because if I have you know, an equal concentration of sodium chloride and an equal concentration of calcium chloride, and by concentration I mean moles per liter, molarity, let's say, well, we got to be careful here, because when you put sodium chloride, say, in water, what does it do? So don't say break down. Separate. Separates or dissociates. And what does it form? You get separate sodium ions and separate chloride ions. And so if you have one molar NaCl, that's not what really matters. What really matters is how many separate pieces you have. In one molar NaCl, there's one molar sodium ions and one molar chloride ions for a grand total of two molar of anything that doesn't look like water in this case. But calcium chloride also dissociates. What does it dissociate into? Yeah, you get one calcium ion, but you actually get two chloride ions. And in this case, in one molar calcium chloride, one to one ratio here, you get one molar calcium ions, but one to two ratio here, you get a two molar chloride ion concentration resulting and a total of a three molar concentration of ions. And so my question for you is assuming you were to put equal concentrations of these to salt the roads, which would be a better choice? CaCl2, it has a bigger impact because it breaks up into more pieces, more ions in this case. And in fact, CaCl2 is generally the salt they use to salt the roads, not NaCl. So if you look, we define what's called a Van Hoff factor. And the Van Hoff factor has the symbol lowercase i, lowercase i. I think my blue marker's giving up the ghost here. But lowercase i. It is the number of pieces a particular compound breaks up into. Like NaCl, how many pieces did this formula unit break up into? Two. Its Van Hoff factor would be two. What would be the Van Hoff factor for calcium chloride? Three. That's not a T. Cool. And this can get a little bit tricky. You know, the moment I put something like, say, aluminum nitrate on there, and I ask it for his Van Hoff factor, you've got to be a little bit careful. A lot of students just start counting up all the atoms present. But with a polyatomic ion, you can't do that. The polyatomic ion doesn't itself break up. So what's the cation in this ionic compound? Yeah. Al. And so you get a single aluminum ion. But what's the anion in this compound, aluminum nitrate? Yeah, nitrate, and you get three of them. And so what would the Van Hoff factor for aluminum nitrate be? Good, don't break up the polyatomics themselves. And you get a total of four ions here. And so for aluminum nitrate, I would equal four. Cool, so now we know what a Van Hoff factor is. So what if I gave you something like, say, this. This is methanol. This is glucose. Notice they're all nonmetals, all nonmetals. And most molecular compounds, you know, excusing the acids anyways, most molecular compounds besides the acids are not electrolytes, which means they don't dissociate into any ions. And so what Van Hoff factor would they have? Just one. They don't break up into pieces. They're just one thing as they are. They can still dissolve into water if like dissolves like anyways. If they're like water, if they're pretty polar like, whoop, if they're pretty polar like water, but they won't actually dissociate into separate ions as non-electrolytes. Cool. So they'd have Van Hoff factors of one. Cool. Typical question you might get 
is you might get equal concentrations of a bunch of different compounds, and you might just be asked which one has the highest, you know, boiling point, or which one has the lowest freezing point, for example. And actually, before we go there, let's do one more thing real quick. We typically, with a lot of colligative properties, in particular the first two, freezing point, depression, boiling point, elevation, we don't usually use concentrations measured in molarity. We actually, instead of molarity, use concentrations measured in molality. And molality is not capital M, it's lowercase m for its symbol. So what is the definition of molality? It's still moles of solute, just like molarity, but it's not liters of solution on bottom. It's moles of solute per kilogram of solvent, per kilogram of solvent. So a new unit of concentration for dealing with colligative properties. But, you know, similar way of calculating, you know, just plug and chug. And so in this case, let's say I told you that we had one molal NaCl. So we had 0 0.6 molal calcium chloride at 0 0.7 molal aluminum nitrate and 1.5 molal glucose. And the question is, which one of these would have the biggest change in any one of these colligative properties that I want to talk about? Which one would have the biggest change in one of these colligative properties? And what I mean is, which one would have its freezing point go down the most? Which one would have its boiling point go up the most? Which one would have its vapor pressure go down the most for the solution? OK. And again, implied here is that these are all dissolved in water. OK. So in this case, what you actually want to look at is not just the overall molality. What you really want to look at here is the total concentration of all the pieces. And you'll get that if you take the number of pieces it breaks up into, the Van Hoff factor, times the molality. That'll give you the overall concentration of pieces it breaks up into. And the greater the number of pieces, the greater V's properties are affected. So what would I times M be equal to for NaCl here in this case? Two. Van Hoff factor is two times one molal. This comes out to two molal total. What's I times M for the next solution? It's 1.8. What is it for the next solution? Anybody? 2.8. Van Hoff factor of aluminum nitrate was 4. 4 times 0.7 is 2.8. So, and the last one? Cool. And so my question again is which one has its colligative properties changed the most? the one with the greatest overall concentration of pieces. In this case, the aluminum nitrate. Which one of these has its colligative properties changed the least? Yeah, the one with the lowest overall concentration of pieces. So let's look at what this means again. <clears throat> so my next question for you, and I'm asking a couple of different ways. So freezing points. When you start adding solute, the freezing point begins to go down. And what's the freezing point of pure water again? Zero degrees Celsius. My question is, which of these solutions that are all in water would have a freezing point closest to zero degrees Celsius? One way I could ask this question. Which one closest to zero? Yeah, the last one. It's the one that changes the least, right? OK, which one's furthest from zero? Yeah, this guy with the greatest overall I am. Now look at how this question can change a little bit. If I asked you which one has the largest freezing point depression, and when I say largest freezing point depression, which means the largest decrease in the freezing point. So which one is that again? Yeah, 
the aluminum nitrate again, the largest decrease in its freezing point, the largest freezing point depression. Now listen to a slightly different question here. Which one of these solutions has the, not largest freezing point depression this time, but which one of these solutions has the highest freezing point period? Well notice these all, pure water has a freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. And again, the freezing points when you add solute all go down from there, from zero. But the question wasn't which one went down the most like it was a second ago. Which one had the largest freezing point depression? That's not the question. The question is which one has the overall highest freezing point period? Well, that would be this guy, right? His freezing point's higher than his or his or his. And he's the one that actually went down the least. It's a tricky question. And so in this case, which of these has the overall highest freezing point? The last one here, Lower, lowest overall concentration of pieces. So be careful, because I can ask you for the largest freezing point depression or the overall highest freezing point. There are two different answers in this case. Notice I can't do that with boiling point elevation. Boiling points go up. The one that's gone up the most is also overall the highest, and it works the same way. It's only tricky about freezing point versus freezing point depression. Yeah. So again, there are two different questions. One is, which one has the largest decrease in its freezing point? Same thing as which one has the largest freezing point depression? And that's the one with the greatest concentration of pieces. The other way to word it, though, is which one has the highest freezing point? Not freezing point depression, just plain old freezing point. And the one with the highest freezing point is the one that has gone down the least, which would be the one with the lowest overall concentration of pieces. So tricky.